The book of the Hebrew prophet Zechariah is one of the most important books in understanding the future. There is nothing in the book of Revelation which deals with the return of Jesus that is not elsewhere in Scripture, particularly the Old Testament. Of the books of the New Testament, there are books written to Jews and books written to non-Jews in the New Testament. John's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel were written to people who were Jewish. The Epistle to the Hebrews, the Epistle of James, the Epistle of Peter, the Epistle of Jude are all written to Jews. This is not to say that their content does not apply to non-Jews, but it is to say that in order for non-Jews to understand what that content of these books means, we have to first of all understand it was written to people in the first century who were Jewish. Similarly, for Jewish believers, they have to understand that epistles like Philippians were written to people who are not Jewish. That's not to say that the content of Philippians does not co-equally apply to Jewish believers in Jesus. It does. But it does mean that Jewish believers have to understand that unlike Hebrews or unlike Jude, it was written to non-Jews. Of all of the books of the New Testament, however, by far the most Hebraic book, the most Jewish book in its literary character, in its development of theme, in its symbolism, by far the most Jewish book from a literary and theological perspective in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. It draws its themes and motifs more from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, than any other book in the New Testament. The book of Revelation is the only book of the Scripture that includes a special blessing on reading it. Unfortunately, because Martin Luther couldn't understand it, he said it wasn't worth reading. Hence, even conservative evangelical Lutheran theologians either ignore Revelation or they read it with the view of something called poemicism. They simply see it as spiritual poetry to encourage the church that Jesus is coming someday and to persevere during times of difficulty or persecution. They don't really look at it prophetically. In other words, because Luther didn't understand it, most Lutherans don't see a need to understand it. Now we have to understand that Luther was a man who began right but ended badly. In many ways. During the Peasants' Revolt, he, ad he advocated that peasants be stabbed in the back. When Jews wouldn't convert to Christianity, he basically wrote something and preached sermons that were quoted extensively by Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf. Hitler extensively quoted Luther. Hence, Lutheranism, like Roman Catholicism, has built into it this anti-Jewish theology, which is directly contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. Given the fact that Luther himself put so much emphasis on the Book of Romans, he understates the importance of Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul tells us the covenants with the Jews, the patriarchal covenants, are the root of the Christian church, that God is not finished with them, and that the Jews are the natural branches. For a man who emphasized Romans so much, and its message of grace and justification by faith, he ignored a major section of Romans. Luther never fully broke with Catholicism in his theology. Roman Catholicism is based more on patristic tradition. It's based on the teachings of Augustine of Hippo and those who influenced him, such as Ambrose of Milan, 
Cyprian of Carthage, then directly on the New Testament. Yet Luther, seeking to redress the errors of Rome, followed in their errors. He never completely broke with this patristic tradition of the Church Fathers. He himself was an Augustinian monk, and he kept Augustinian ideas. Luther actually wrote, Quius religio, eius regio, eius regio, quius religio. Whatever your government is, your religion should be. If you live in a Catholic country, be a Catholic. If you live in a Protestant country, be a Protestant. Luther actually taught that. Luther taught that every Jew should be hoarded into a corral and forced to confess Christ at the point of a knife. He said, we, we the German nation are to blame, for we do not kill the Jews to prove we are Christians. We are believers. Now we know what the Nazis did here in Denmark. They occupied it. King Christian went against this tradition. He was not an anti-Semite. We saw what the Nazis did in Norway. Your country suffered tremendously under the Nazis. Yet, part of the legacy of Luther is that he directly inspired Adolf Hitler. You can read Mein Kampf and Hitler quotes him and does not quote him out of context. But there's more to it. <clears throat> Luther's view of consubstantiation is not far removed from the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. Luther continued to baptize babies to sprinkle infants, making baptism the equivalent of circumcision, something that Paul says not to do. It's a personal choice. It's not part of a national covenant. The prophecies of Jeremiah 31 says there'll be a new covenant. Well, what new covenant? I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant would be made with Israel and the Jews, according to Jeremiah. And it would not be like the one I made with their fathers. Luther's mistake. He forgot that the new covenant was made with the Jews, not with the church. Paul says this again in Romans chapter 9. The covenants, both of them, diethike in Greek, plural, both the old and the new are made with the Jews. To them belongs. In the Greek, present continuous active. The new covenant and the old still belong to the Jews. In other words, if God is finished with the Jews, he's automatically finished with the church because the church has no covenant. Jesus never made a covenant with the church. Never. He never made a covenant with the church. The new covenant was made with Israel and the Jews. It was inaugurated at the Last Supper, a Jewish Paschal Seder. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We have to understand Luther was a man who began right and ended badly. Not only did he preach murder, not only did he not fully break with Roman Catholicism, not only did he teach the supersessionist errors of replacement theology concerning Israel, but he ended his life heretically denying the canonicity portions of the New Testament he disagreed with. Because he misunderstood the difference between works and works of the law, he dismissed the epistle of James. He actually said a book of the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament ever written, the oldest book is the epistle of James. Luther said it's not canonical. He almost said the same thing about the book of Revelation. He ended his life a false teacher and a preacher of murder. There is no doubt he began right. There is no doubt Martin Luther began right. Neither is there any doubt that he ended wrong. Now, I'm not his judge. I don't know his eternal standing. That's for God to say. I only know what he wrote 
what he taught and what he did. In the beginning, most of what he wrote was absolutely right. Towards the end, so much was seriously, dangerously, and terribly, terribly wrong. Just think of kings like Joash in the Old Testament. In the beginning, he was right. But when he got old, he became wrong. How could somebody who had been so right have ended up so wrong? Well, let that be a warning to the rest of us. If somebody who God used as much as God used Luther had been so right for so long and then ended so terribly badly, if that could happen to King Joash or to Luther, it can certainly happen to Jacob Prash or to you. Let us take heed lest we too fall. In no way am I denying that Luther was right. In no way am I denying that in the beginning God used him. But I would have to be a liar and a hypocrite to close my eyes to the fact that he ended badly. Hatred of the Jews, anti-Semitism, replacement theology, these things do not come from Jesus. Martin Luther ended up not just inspiring the Reformation, he inspired Hitler and the Third Reich and the Holocaust. His words are unmistakable. Instead of reforming the church, he partially reformed the church. He helped put it back on the right road. But he did not break the unscriptural marriage of church and state or reverse the error of infant baptism. The new covenant would not be like the one I made with their fathers. In the old covenant, we see the following. Jeremiah was against the problem that people thought because they were circumcised as babies, because they were members of a Jewish nation, they were automatically in a covenant relationship with God, even though their hearts were far from him as individuals. Jeremiah said, when a new covenant comes, it will not be like that. When John the Baptist, Yohanan HaMatbil, shows up, he deals with the same thing. He tells the Pharisees, you think you're Abraham's children? God can raise up Abraham's children out of the stones. They thought because they were part of a national religion, a national church, because they were circumcised, they were in a relationship with God by virtue of the fact that they were part of a nation. Well, Jeremiah said the Messiah would get rid of this. John the Baptist would say the Messiah was going to get rid of this. Jesus did get rid of it and give a new covenant. And Paul confirms that Jesus got rid of it and gave a new covenant. But what Jesus got rid of, Constantine put it back. Augustine put it back. The medieval papacy, the Church of Rome, put it back. The Eastern Orthodox Church put it back. And instead of going back to Scripture, Luther and the Reformers went back to the Church Fathers. They put it back. Instead of a Roman Catholic State Church, they replaced it with a Protestant one. Sprinkle the babies instead of circumcising them. One of the most deadly things you can do is to tell people they're Christians when they're not. We are baptized into his death. Who in their right mind would take a baby, put it in a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead? Sprinkling infants is ridiculous. We can dedicate infants we can understand that the children of true believers are 
seen differently than the children of non-believers in the eyes of God through the faith of their parents. But God has no grandchildren. He only has children. They must spiritually die and become new creations. Now, if they grow up in a Christian home, a Christian church that teaches the true gospel, this can happen at a young age. But it must happen. Then you can baptize them. Once you begin telling people they're Christians when they're not, you've already created a barrier to salvation. We have to realize where Luther was right. We have to realize where Luther was wrong. Luther is not the standard. The Word of God is the standard. Rightly dividing it is the task. That's what we need to look at. Do not allow yourself, your church, your ministry, your family to be bound by the tradition of Luther. Don't do that. It is a big, big mistake. Understand and appreciate his good points from his early ministry. But also realize the terrible things he said and did when he got old. Terrible things. Things that quite literally inspired Adolf Hitler. There's no getting away from this. It may offend people's sentiments or their religion or my parents were in the Lutheran church and you're offending my family. Jesus doesn't care about that garbage. He said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Simply because someone is your parents doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> it's our father in heaven who's right. We've got to go back to the New Testament, not to the church fathers. It's not, this is what Luther said, or this is what Augustine said. It's what does the Word of God say. That must be the only basis. Now Luther taught, sola gracia, sola fide, sola scriptura. Only by grace, only by faith, and only by the Word of God. Sola Scriptura. He wrote it. He said it. I only wish he meant it. But he went through the New Testament and effectively ripped out the bits he disagreed with including the first book of the New Testament ever written because he misunderstood it. The book of Revelation speaks about the return of Jesus. It's his revelation to the church about his second coming. And the closer we get to his return, the more important that book is going to become. We must prayerfully and carefully study it. The same as we must study the Old Testament prophets who are quoted in it. Daniel, Ezekiel, Joel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses from the Exodus especially, and not least of all, Zechariah. In our next excerpt, we're going to be looking at a prophecy of Zechariah chapter 5 and how it comes into play in the book of Revelation.